our best this morning. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to praise? <laughs> Let's go. God is good. All the time. <laughs> Amen. Let's give him our best. continue we praise you father we thank you this day is a day you've created and we're so grateful and rejoicing we thank you you've made us right here father and we're just excited our expectations are high and we thank you father we praise you in jesus name amen let's continue to just lift our voice
Jesus, we thank you this morning. We honor you in this house, Father God. We thank you that you're a good God and you watch over your word to perform it, Lord. So we thank you this morning. We thank you for this time of praise and worship. Thank you, Father God, that you're a good God. And we thank you and I give you praise for each and every person that's here and those that are tuned in as well. And we give you all the honor and all the glory and all that God's people said. Amen. Amen. Let's give Jesus a good hand clap. This morning, amen? Praise God. Good to see everybody in the house of the Lord this morning, amen? amen. Do we have any first-time guests with us this morning? Any first-time guests, simply just raise your hand, and we would like to acknowledge you, and we're not going to embarrass you, but we want to welcome you this morning. Any first-time guests? Any first-time guests? Praise God, amen? Well, do so, right back here, sir. Thank you so very much. Right here, back to your right, amen. Thank you so much, sir. Praise God. You saved the congregation this morning because uh, Pastor was probably going to send me out to Home Depot and go grab a couple guys uh, and ladies to come be, be first-time guests. No, just easy. <laughs> Sir, are you from Bakersfield or outside the city of Bakersfield? Where's that from? John Paul. Well, welcome, John Paul. Now, where, where are you? Are you from Bakersfield or outside the city of Bakersfield? Bakersfield. Let's give John Paul a, a good hey, amen. You know what? That's a good Bible name. I got Renee. I'm stuck with that. I always wanted to be an Alex, but that didn't work out either. Praise yeah. God. Amen. And I guess they named me because of some band name, Renee Renee. And here I am. Praise God. Amen. 
And I found out they're going to be here in the fall. Praise the Lord. Amen. <laughs> That's what I was told. Amen. Well, take a second. Greet somebody. John Paul, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Take a second. Let's greet somebody new this morning. Praise God. John Paul, if somebody come back and said hi to you, they greeted you. Okay, you got to make sure that you greet guests. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Well, you can be seated now that you've greeted one another. I tell you what. Still. You hear? You hear all that going on? That's visitation. That's totally okay. All right. Oh, what right now? Now, when we get into the message, you don't like to hear that going on. But at the same time, get your Bibles. Turn to Luke chapter 6 with me. It's time to receive our morning tithes and offering. Any cheerful givers excited about giving and all the things? I'm going to tell you, y'all have to help me with this because a lot of people, and thank God for it, give online. And they use push pay. They, they, they do the different things. And... Hallelujah. Thank God for the online giving. But how many of you realize it's hard to hear you shout hallelujah when you're doing it online? Uh, so I just have to shout for you, and we all have a good time. But that's why I, I like to hear cheerful givers uh, shouting and praising God. So Luke 6, get your tithes and offerings ready. Brother Jesse has a great teaching. I encourage all of you to go online and get it about the types of giving and the kinds of giving. There's tithes, there's alms, there's first fruit, and then there's seed. And sometimes we're doing all of that at one time. And tithing and putting over and above offerings and seed and alms. And so be obedient. But look at what Jesus said in Luke 6, 36. Therefore be merciful, just as your Father also is merciful. Judge not, and you shall not be judged. Condemn not, and you shall not be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Now, you notice there's not a change in the thought. There's not a change in what he's saying. There's not a change of instruction. Right in the middle of, of all of that, at, well, at the end of all of that, he goes on and says, Give, and it will be given to you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will be put into your bosom. For with the same measure that you use, it will be measured back to you. Did you notice that uh, Jesus said, Be merciful. Condemn not, judge not, uh, forgive, and it will be forgiven. Give. He put it all in there together. There wasn't like a missing of a breath or a changing of the subject. All of those are in red, and all of those are something we do to benefit us. You don't forgive, as, as Dr. Richard Roberts said uh, last Sunday, you don't forgive for that person. You forgive for you. You don't be merciful for that person, even though it benefits. You're merciful so that you will be mercy. You don't condemn so that you won't be condemned. So if you look at this, all of this is putting principles into operation for us and other people. And in there, he says, give. And it will be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. Will they hasten to give unto your bosom? A bosom was a big pocket they used to make. In the outfits they wore in that day, they would make it into a bosom pocket. And that they could fill that thing up and it would be like huge amount of what they could do. Uh, some of the modern ladies, you know, they'll put things in their aprons. They used to and fill that apron up. Same type principle. And it says it'll be pressed down, shaken together and running over. Now, I don't know about you. I like those kind of blessings. Kind of like honey. You put honey on your bread. How many of you have mastered the art of putting honey on your toast and the honey staying on your toast? 
And if you've mastered that, when you go to eat it, it's now on your fingers. And it's everywhere. But the good thing about it, we had honey this morning. The good thing about it is, you don't care. <laughs> Who cares? You know, that's the time you turn your back where you can you lick your fingers up. Because it's running over. It's honeycomb giving. That's the way the Lord is instructing us to be givers, to be obedient. So put your offering in your hand. Let's pray. You agree with me as you sow your seed, your tithes, your offerings, your first fruits. Father, we thank you as we sow this seed. We sow it in obedience to you. You said give, and it'd be given back unto us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. You said when we sow seeds, as long as the earth remains, seed time and harvest. So, Father, we plant this seed, sow it. We give our tithes so that you'll open the windows of heaven and pour out the blessing. We sow our first fruits so that, Father, there would be... Our barns would be full and our vats would be overflowing with plenty. We thank you for, if we give to the poor and have pity on the poor, you said you lend to you and you will repay. So, Father, we thank you for it. And all of these ways of giving is working within our church, within us. We take authority over all of the weeds that would try to steal our seeds and cause there to not be a harvest. We take authority over those things that would hinder and release the angels to go bring our harvest in, our return in now, in Jesus' precious name. And everyone agrees? Amen. Ushers, minister to the people, would you come? Would you and the band just come? Jesus, my Savior, Lord, there is none like you. All of my days, I want to praise the wonders of your mighty love. Mountains bow down and the seas will roar. 
Glory to God. You can be seated. Thank you. I usually say one sound and one voice. In this case, it's just one voice. The band uh, was in a small little CD player, thank God. But Keith, I mean, Keith was here. He's ready to go, man. He's after it. But uh, things have come up, and they weren't able to make it. So I was watching Shelby scrambling this morning in there. I was trying to figure out where she was, and she was in there putting a CD together and uh, doing these kind of things, instant, in season and out, ready to go, always, amen, but it was great, thank you for being obedient, thank Pastor Renee for doing last Wednesday night, did he uh, preach all week's messages, or did he just barely touch on one, I, I saw parts of it and didn't get to see all of it, but at the same time, I appreciate them so much, you got your Bibles, hold them up. Shake them around, move them around, make the devil mad. How many of you realize now, just shaking it around doesn't make him mad. It's when you believe it and do it that it makes him mad and gets him angry. So get your Bibles out. I'm going to jump into this. Let me give a report. Now, remember I asked you if you came to the uh, Richard Roberts meeting and you were healed to please let us know. And we have already two, two miracle reports that came in. Gina... Well, uh, well, t uh, Texas said that she had pain in her arm and really, uh, uh, really bad and all that. And it left instantly. And she was healed. And then Donna Brown, uh, she was watching from the coast. And they watch her and Danny log in all the time. And they're always watching and a part of us. But she said she felt a jolt of power in her right shoulder. And she had no more lower back pain. And she'd had that since 2017. And it left instantly. Isn't that God good? Uh, I mean, you can be here or you can be watching overnight. Now, don't get any ideas. I want you here. But there's no boundaries in the spirit. And I appreciate that. Also, Gina sent word and I, uh, I'm, Casey may have sent it. And I haven't actually got to look at emails or anything yet. But the Thursday night group fed 50 uh, meals. And then this morning group fed over 100 meals. So just that group, not counting all that Casey and the team went out, we've, had, we've ministered to over 150 people already. This, isn't that great? God is so good. How many of you have been ministered to already this week? I know it's Sunday, the first of the week. Well, if you haven't, let me be the first to do it and minister to you. Life-changing words. Are you ready for that? I'm going to pray for you, you pray for me, and let's believe God and enter into his presence. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the anointing that's on that word. And we thank you that you've based your church on revelation knowledge of that word. So, Father, as I teach and preach and minister the word, cause the ears of the hearer to not only listen but to hear. Allow it to be an illumination into their heart and into their spirit. Cause there to be supernatural increase in direction in their spirit realm and soul and body and financially and socially father supernatural things will give you the credit will give you the glory we thank you for it we're honored to be able to minister to you the word all the prayers have already gone up to bind any hindrance so father there's a freedom and a liberty that only you can give and we thank you for it we praise you for it in jesus precious name and everyone agrees amen now i want to say this and call you to prayer Please don't forget to lift up our firefighters. They're on the front lines fighting these fires up there. And if you haven't noticed, uh, we've just had the biggest fire in all of the U.S. history right up here. In the, is it the Dixie Fire? Is that the one? And then there's a fire at Lake Isabella. I was uh, checking on Aunt Patty up there and the, and the webs to make sure everybody's good and Jeff and all up in Isabella. And you got that going on. You got flooding going on on the other side. And all around that, you have our border patrol that need our prayers, our immigration officers that need our prayers. We need to pray for our troops. And we need to pray for the people and the, the, uh, the, people and the Christians in Afghanistan. We need to be lifting it up. Now, hindsight's always 20-20. But we can't change it if it's already happened. What we've got to do is get to praying and release faith on what's going to happen. And this is a joke, right, on this part. Those parts are not joke. But it's so simple. Have you noticed that you have to become a politician to become dumb? 
I mean, think about it. I could, I I want y'all to, I want you to get impressed. I could solve the Afghanistan problem instant. You just get every plane you can get. You put it in there. You land it. You fill it as full as you can fill it. And you fly to Juarez or to Tijuana. You let them off. They just walk across the border. There's no vetting. There's no problems. You just let them across. I mean, some of you did not enjoy that at all. Okay. (laughs) Quickly, in your Bibles, Luke chapter 9. I had a whole lot more fun with that than you, but anyway. Someone said, well, that's not really a joke. That's a pretty good idea. I know you think like I do, but anyway. (laughs) Everything is complicated when man tries to use their wisdom when they try to figure out what they want. But again, the police officers, uh, the immigration and the border agents and our military and our firefighters especially, be lifting them up right now. Do not stop praying divine protection over law enforcement. It's a crazy, crazy time out there. But the church shouldn't be caught unaware. It shouldn't surprise us because there's perilous times in the last days as it gets worse and worse. And all you got to do is look around and know we are in the last days. Now, I know they may have been saying that for a thousand years, but look at it this way. We're closer to it than any generation's ever been. We're the closest anybody's ever been to the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you. I look around watching. I said, you know, this is so easy to solve. Come quickly, Lord Jesus. How many of you know he's already solved it? It's man's thinking. But in your Bibles, turn to Luke 9. We've been doing a teaching, and I've been calling this for, uh, to have fun with you. Who's your daddy? Shelby said she ministered to the ladies' ministry yesterday, and they ministered, stay in your lane. And she read me the, about the, uh, the race and the things that we did at Morrow uh, Rock when we did the, the Rock to Pier run. And I, I remembered it, and everything she was saying, I'm thinking, oh, man, I wish I'd have thought of that. That's a sermon. I can use that. But there are so many things and illustrations that we can use in this. But I just call this, who's your daddy? In other words, are you a chip off of the old block? Are you the spitting image of your father? Or are, I don't take this wrong, are you you? If they see you, do they see the father? If they see me, do they see Jesus? If they see the church... Do they sense the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ? Do they sense an anointing of being there? When's the last time anybody ever came up to you and I, and I realize some of you have had this happen, and you've shared it with me and all that, and they just said, I don't know what it is, but there's just something about you that I really like. Now, usually it's like, they back off from you. But when's the last time you sensed that people want to be around you? People want, better yet, people want to be like you. We've changed that, but this is basically a teaching that I'm sharing with you. And today it's going to come together of why I'm sharing this with you and to you. And it's about authority. It's about whose image we're made in. It's about in the image and likeness of God. You don't have to go there. We're going to Luke 9. But in Genesis 1, if you remember 26, 27, and 28, God said, let us make man in our image and in our likeness and let them have dominion. So right there is our purpose and right there is the way we were created and formed and fashioned and put in this earth. And then he said, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth and subdue it, which means there's a battle that has to be fought that he's even telling Adam about. The word likeness means a resemblance and representative form of, I mean, image means that. And likeness means after the original pattern. Like if you ladies were going to take a pattern and make an outfit or a dress, or if you men that so were going to take a, a, a pattern and make an outfit at, or even a, a carpenter or, or someone that takes plans and forms and builds something out of it, you and I were fashioned, formed, created, and built in the image of God with Him being the pattern. And because we are built and made and in the image of God, 
after his pattern, it's so that we can exercise dominion in the earth. And we've seen in this teaching that our dominion is over all the principalities and powers and the rulers of the darkness of this world and the wicked spirits and high and heavenly places. We are supposed to walk in dominion. We're supposed to rule and reign over those forces. Adam gave it away, but Jesus bought it back. He gave it to us, and that's where Luke 9 comes in. Look at this. It says there, Then he called his twelve disciples together, gave them power and authority over all demons and to cure diseases. Look at that. Power and authority. If you look that up and study it out to its farthest degree, he's saying, I give you authority, the ability to use it, and the right to use it. So he gave us the right, the ability, the inherent capacity to use authority in the earth over the enemy. Now it didn't say, behold, I give you power and authority over all people. See, that's where everybody messes it up. That's where everybody, they just want to rule and reign over people. This is its rule and reign over the demons and over diseases and over the things of the world. Now turn to Luke 10, verse 17. Then the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Behold, now what that word behold means look, watch, behold. I give you the authority to trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Jesus literally in the mouth of two or three witnesses, let every word be established, he's saying, I give you authority to use the power and might that's in God and in the Lord Jesus Christ to have dominion over the forces of the evil. That's why we have to subdue it. It's obvious from Genesis 1 there was an enemy that had to be subdued, something that has to be controlled and brought under. But unfortunately, we're in a day and hour where the enemy seems to be controlling everybody, including people in the church. I got head nods, but no amens. I didn't say it was you. How many? Look at the person to your left and right and say, you're the exception. Look at both sides. Say it to everybody. Okay. Now look over here at me. Let me tell you, you're the exception. You are. Now, stay with me. With, I mean, now, how many of you believe what you just said? Some of you now you're raising your hand. Why do you say it then? You, you need to start believing what you say because if you won't believe me, maybe you'll believe yourself. But look at this. It says here, dominion. Jesus gave us the inherent capacity, ability, and the anointing to operate in that authority and power, and he gave us the right to do it. But people get hung up on wrestling and fighting in the flesh realm instead of realizing that, now watch this because I'm going to show you this biblically, your influence is in the flesh and natural realm, but your battle and your warfare and your dominion is in the spirit realm. And people get that all mixed up. Now, Matthew 16, you don't have to turn there, Matthew 16, 13 through 19, if you remember, that Jesus looked at him and said, who do, you say, who do men say I am? And they gave him different apostles and prophets and different things. He said, who do you say I am? And then Peter said, thou art the Christ, the Son of God, the living God. And Jesus looked at him and said, you're a rock. And not just a stone, you're a rock. And on that rock, well, first he said, flesh and blood didn't reveal this to you. My heavenly Father did. And then he said, on that rock, I'm going to build my church. What rock? The Father revealing who Christ is to us, the church. The Father giving revelation knowledge of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. And on that it says, I will build my church. Now watch this. And then he adds this. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. All the other translations say the powers of hell, the forces of hell. So watch this. When you get a revelation 
of who the Lord Jesus Christ is, what he's done for you, you receive him into your heart, you make him the Lord of your life, and then you take the word of God, which he is the word made flesh, and you make that rule and reign in your life. Next thing you know, you not only become a new creation, a new created being, you start seeing and having an anointing that the gates of hell, the powers of hell, cannot conquer and cannot prevail against. And the church has basically, not this one, when I say the church, I'm talking about in general, the church has gotten away from their authority. Now let me tell you why, and then I'm going to biblically prove this to you. It's because we only seem to activate after something's happened. Society acts a certain way, we better get to praying. Society or somebody does a certain thing, we better get to praying and binding and loosening. You need to, and I need to, we need to, a church needs to do this before it happens. Because we have the authority and we have the right. Now, you cannot exercise authority unless you're under authority. So many people want this anointing. They want the power and the anointing and the right to use it and that capability I'm talking about, but they don't want to be under anybody. And we saw in, in the scriptures that the centurion knew how to get Jesus to say the word, and he had great faith because he said, I'm under authority. I understand authority. So you be under authority to be in authority, and I'm going to make this statement. You are either exercising your authority or somebody is exercising authority over you. You're either making things happen or you're letting things happen to you. One of the other, two, one of those different things. So you will either exercise authority or it will be exercised over you. Now, again, you cannot be in authority unless you're under authority. So we started the last time I ministered to you on who you should be under authority to. Not just everybody that tells you what to do, everything going on around you. That's not your authority. Now stay with me on this even if you don't like some of it. I'm your pastor and I love you and I want to help you. And you'll see why in a minute. The first thing you need to do is be under the authority of the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. We call him the Lord Jesus. Jesus is Lord. But there's a difference in him being your Savior, your Messiah, than being your Lord. You need to be under the Lordship of the Lord Jesus Christ. Number two, you need to be under the Lordship of the Word. My assignment, you've heard me tell me, I didn't get my assignment. I got my call, I got my direction, I got my uh, in, uh, vision, I got everything I'm supposed to be doing and everything like that, but I never had it settled in me about my assignment until I was sitting, we were sitting behind Oral Roberts at a meeting, and I was sharing this with Richard when we were together, and he just got tears. He said, boy, I know that feeling. And I told him they set Oral Roberts in front of Shell and I because they knew we'd protect him and we knew him and, and things like that. And he was sitting there and he opened his Bible and he had a picture of Evelyn in there and she'd already graduated and was already in heaven. And he just loved, was rubbing that picture and, and he just said, I love you. And it clicked in me, my assignment. My assignment is to get you to fall in love with the Word. I want you to fall in love with the Word, not do it because pastor said. Not do it because, oh, God, I got to do, uh, you know, I would enjoy that, but, God, I got to do it because the Word said. No, I want you to love the Word. So much so, and Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments, His Word. And then the next thing you know is you love the Word, you'll keep the Word. And as you love the Word, you'll find an anointing to be able to keep the Word. You find it working in both things. But then I told you this. You have to be under the authority of the Lordship of Jesus Christ. You have to be under the authority of the Word in that order, the Jesus, the Word. Then you have to be under the authority of a pastor. 
You see how it's kind of, you know, well, thank God I get to choose. Well, technically, if you're under the lordship of Jesus and under the lordship of word, they're supposed to choose who for you. But I know churches that are not under the authority of a pastor. I mean, they have a teacher, they have a leader, they have uh, uh, someone, but, but if they're not a pastor set there by God, there is something in there. Next thing you know, you've got people, if they just get upset, well, they'll just break loose and go somewhere else. That's why I use the term blood clot instead of an arm or a leg. Or a, we're supposed to be knitted in. We're supposed to be connected in. We're supposed to be connected together. And that's where you come. I don't expect you to agree with everything I say. I don't expect you to like everything I say. I expect you to love me like I love you. That's biblical. But listen, you still need a pastor. And those of you that are submitted unto me as pastor, I'm going to show you in a minute biblically why. Biblically. See, Matthew, thir what, Hebrews 13 and, and 8, Jesus Christ the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. The word never changes. The verse before that says, have respect for those who rule over you and are faithful to speak into your life. So there's a part of that working and being in there. So we have to be under the authority of a pastor. How many of you know what? A flock of sheep is not a flock of sheep unless they have a shepherd. They're just a bunch of sheep. It's not a flock. But if they're a flock, they're under pasture. Here's the trouble. Pastors... Shepherds don't understand they must have a shepherd that's chief to them also. Because you can't be in authority unless you're under authority. But I'm going to show you some things in the Word of God this morning that I saw and I thought, oh, wow, does that come together. Not because I'm your pastor, but because I think pastoring is something you're serious about. It's just not something you want to do or you decide to do. It's something you're called. So you better be serious about it. Or you'll burn out and get all fed up and tired. Now, there is, here's where I want you to go. There is no authority without responsibility. I'll say it again. There is no authority without responsibility. See, that's what we have going on in major political realms and all that. Everybody wants authority, but nobody wants to be responsible. You must have responsibility to be in authority. So I said it this way. There's no authority without responsibility, and only with responsibility comes authority the reason you sit under a pastor is so he can give you some responsibilities and when you have responsibilities authority comes with it because you're responsible let me prove that to you turn to matthew 21 or 25 21 matthew 25 verse 21 let me prove it to you biblically There is no authority without responsibility, and only with responsibility comes authority. It's not the reverse. You don't get an authority and then become responsible. You become responsible, and then authority comes with it. Look at uh, Matthew 25 and 21. His Lord said to him, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Now, I've heard that quoted and heard the other places in the Scripture used to say, if you're faithful with the little things, then God will give you even bigger things. That's not what he says. That is not what it says right there. It says, if you are faithful in the small things, I will be able to make you a ruler, authority, over bigger things. With responsibility comes authority. Listen to the New Living Translation there. The master was full of praise. Well done, my good and faithful servant. 
You've been faithful in handling this small amount. Now watch this. So now I will give you many more responsibilities. Let's celebrate together. So responsibility brings authority. When you're responsible in the small things, then you can operate in authority over the bigger things. But you don't get in a position of authority and then think, I'll now do those little things. That's the reverse. It comes in the reverse. Ruling, now I made a note here, those of you that are taking notes, ruling, reigning, walking in authority is based on faithfulness. Matthew 25, 21. Ruling, reigning, and walking in authority is based on faithfulness. Faithfulness is not based on ruling. Now let me explain that. I'll use a very prime example we got. Washington, D.C. Just because you're ruling doesn't make them faithful. But if you're faithful, that opens the door for you to rule. So faithfulness opens the door for authority, ruling, and reigning. Ruling and reigning doesn't make you faithful. Everybody with me on that? That's not hard. I know you got it. Paul said that. Paul said that God used him. Now, we would all, every minister I know would, for, well, the first thing they say when they get to heaven, of course they want to see Jesus. Of course they want to see loved ones. But almost all of them say, and I like to talk to Paul. Now, not this Paul, but you know Paul. They want to talk to Paul. You know why? He wrote three-fourths of the New Testament. He wrote the epistles to the church. He did all these things. And yes, I want to see the apostles. First Jesus, then my family, and all those that, that have uh, gone to be with the Lord. But I also, I would like to talk to Paul. I would like to see, were you really sick or not? I mean, I'm going to find Adam, see if he's got a belly button. Because that seems to be some people's worries. Or concerns. Now, I can save you some trouble. I don't have to go find him. He does not. He was created. He wasn't born. Neither does Eve. It was after that. Everybody with me? Someone said, well, how do you know you'll see him in heaven? What he did? Because by the time he got to Seth, that means sent from God. And all theologians agree that to name their child that way, he had built back a relationship that he wanted his, the Seth and all. That's why Brother Copen and different ones believe that Melchizedek was Seth. Anyway, moving along. Now, I know someone said, well, Seth was from Noah and all this. Yeah, but follow Cain and Abel, then go on down through that. So look at 1 Thessalonians 2, 4. Let me show you what Paul said. Faithfulness precedes authority authority doesn't guarantee faithfulness now with that in mind look at first Thessalonians 2 4 Paul says this but as we have been approved by God approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel even so we speak not as pleasing men but God who tests our heart notice he said God tested and approved us, then we were put into the ministry of the gospel. Look at 1 Timothy 1.12. Paul again writing to young Timothy. Look what he says here. And I, 1 Timothy 1.12, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who has enabled me, now watch this, because he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Paul literally is saying, because God saw I was faithful, he entrusted me with the gospel. Because Jesus saw I was faithful, he enabled me. Faithfulness came before the ruling and reigning in the authority. Everybody with me there? Now, I made a statement to you, and here's where I want you to buckle up, put your thinking 
spiritual thinking cap on. In fact, shut your mind down to what you've been taught and open your heart up to what you've also been taught but from a different angle. You cannot be made to do something. You can only be influenced to do it. By the way, I'm still on being under the authority of a pastor. That's still my subject. You cannot make someone do anything. But you have an anointing, an authority, and a power enabled, and your capacity is from the Lord to influence people. Now here's the problem. We want to make them do something. And a lot of people will do what you make them do until they see that you're not influenced by the same thing. So you have to influence them. You can't make them, but you've been given authority to do that. So how? How do we do that? How do we influence them? Now, stay with me. Here's, we're going to have some fun right here. Some of you may just need to set your Bible down and say, I know it won't be new because you're a thinking church. It won't give you headaches because you're a thinking church. I know some churches I've ministered to, you could see the gears turning, and then they all look like they had headaches. So we had a miracle service. Anyway, you must remember, I said it earlier, that your influence is in the natural realm, but your authority for battle is in the spiritual realm. Turn to 2 Corinthians 10. Let me show you this. 2 Corinthians 10, 3. Reach down, buckle your seat belt, and get ready. And I'm all, I'm leading to why you need to be under the authority of a pastor. Now, I'm talking about a word preaching, anointed teaching man of God that lives it, preaches it, teaches it, and presents it to you under the anointing of God with the power of the Holy Spirit working. I'm talking about that kind of a pastor that, we're, that all pastors should be striving to be, myself included. Look at 2 Corinthians 10. Look at verse 3. Now, watch this. As it plays out, for though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare, mark warfare in whatever color you got. For though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our warfare are not carnal, mark the word carnal, but mighty in God or mighty of God for Pulling down, mark that, strongholds, mark that, casting down arguments. The New King James says arguments. The King James says imaginations. Does anybody have a translation that says something different? Anybody got one that says something different? Arguments, imaginations. One other one says reasonings. Stay with me on this because... You're going to see something, maybe you've read this many times and had great teaching on it from different ones, but I want you to see it from a little bit different angle in line with what is going. It says, and casting down arguments, imaginations, reasoning, and every high thing that exalts itself against the knowledge of God. Now watch this. You can't miss this little thing that Paul's putting out under the unction of the Holy Spirit, bringing every thought. Now look at this. Our warfare is not carnal. Our weapons are not of flesh or carnal. They're mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, casting down imaginations, arguments, reasonings, and taking every thought. Now, he didn't change the subject here. Look, all of a sudden, he's not talking about spiritual warfare, flesh and carnal, strongholds, and then thoughts. You have to put all of that together to get what he's saying here in picture. And he says, 
and bringing every thought into captivity to the obedience of Christ and being ready to punish all disobedience when your obedience is fulfilled. Now watch this. Do not look at things according to the outward appearance. Don't stop reading before. Don't look at things by what you see. Don't look at things by the outward appearance. Why? Because your weapons are mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds, and it's in the spirit realm. That's why you can't go by the outward appearance. But he still put thoughts in there. Stay with me. If anyone is convinced in himself that he is Christ, let him again consider that in his, this in himself, that just as he is Christ, even so we are Christ. Now, even so he's Christ, we are Christ. That indicates a body. It indicates being one together. The trouble with the devil and the enemy is the world's getting darker and they're in unity. They're together. They're walking together in that darkness. But the church can get its act together and get in unity to bring the light. They'd rather bicker over, over traditions and silly things. How many of you realize we meet on Sunday? That don't make us right and a Saturday meeting church wrong. Nor does it make them right and us wrong. Every day is a day unto the Lord. But, you, but people need to just, before they start fighting and arguing, they just need to stay unified. And they'll spend all their time trying to explain that. It's real simple. The synagogues met on Saturday, so the Christians met on Sunday. But that was when he was resurrected the first day of the week. So that became their resurrection celebration on Sunday. It's not celebrating a moon god or a sun god. It's celebrating the sun and his and S U N no S O N yes. Celebrating that. And they started doing this to not draw attention so they wouldn't necessarily be killed before they get done what they needed to do. But in this, look at the words I told you. Let's break it down just a little bit, if you would. Though we walk in the flesh, we do not war according to the flesh. Adam, go forth, be fruitful, multiply, replenish the earth, subdue, take dominion, rule and reign over it. Then Paul saying now that that ruling and reigning is not the flesh, it's the spiritual realm that we do warfare now, that we do battle. So that word warfare, everybody look at your Bibles again. The word warfare means a battle or a military campaign. Now I'm going to read it a bunch of ways, so watch this. You could say this, for though we walk in the flesh, we don't war according to the flesh. For the weapons of our military campaign are not carnal. Now we think carnal is from the... Greek word is, is talking about meat, and Brother Copen teases about that means we're all meatheads, and he and and, and talking about a carnivore, a car. But the actual word there for carnal means frail, temporary, and human. So let's put this together. Read it with me again. For the weapons of our military campaign are not human, frail, or temporary, but mighty in God. For what? Pulling down. That is a military term that Paul's using, and you pull down a fortress. They would pull down the entrances to the fortresses. So it's actually saying there, watch this, for our military campaign is not with human, frail, temporary means, but mighty in God for the destroying of fortresses. Then he says stronghold. The word stronghold there means positions of power or fortresses. So the weapons of our military campaign are not human, frail, and temporary, they are mighty in God for pulling down fortresses and strongholds and things of power that would come against us. Everybody with me on that? Then it says, casting down 
imaginations. Now, here's where the fun part is. You've heard all this before. The word arguments is what's used in the New King James. Imaginations are used in the King James and others. That word imagination means arguments or reasonings. But if you look up the actual Greek, now stay with me on this. Here we go. I'm still on why you need to sit under the authority of a pastor. Haven't changed. As someone said, do you keep reminding us of that? Yes. Here's what arguments, imaginations mean. The considerations and reflections that precede the determination of a conduct. How many of you realize you can't imagine something that's already happened? It's only an imagination if it precedes the conduct. It has to precede a determined conduct for it to be an imagination. I can only imagine means it hasn't happened yet. An imagination means it hasn't happened. But the word imagination means a consideration and a determination preceding the conduct. Casting down every consideration, argument, and reasoning that is determined by preceding the conduct or the behavior or the action. Let me say it this way. I know you're getting it, but I'm just having fun saying it to myself all these different ways. I have fun doing this, by the way, and if you hadn't figured that out, how sad. I've been here 36 years. You don't do this for 36 years with the same group unless you enjoy yourself and you. That means that people, uh, let me go ahead and say it. Are you ready? Turn around to two or three people and say, I'm ready. You don't do anything without, even if it's briefly, you don't do anything without a consideration and a determination first. You don't, so uh, uh, I was in the military, and they taught us to operate on instinct. That's true, but you had to make a determination to obey, to do that, and let yourself be trained like that, but you have to consider and determine and make a decision to do this conduct. That's why it's imagination. That's why it's, someone said, well, that's like a predetermined. No, I'm not talking about that. Let me say it again like I, like I want you to say. You cannot, it cannot be before the conduct and not be an imagination. If it's before the conduct, then it's a reasoning. And everybody, you and I, are fashioned and formed that way, created that way, and that's why Paul has given us this. You and I are created to have a perceived, determined, conscious reasoning before we act. I can't tell you the number of people that have been in my office over the years that said, I need you to pray with me. I need forgiveness. I need this one to forgive me, that one to forgive me. You know, like that. Well, I... I knew it was wrong, but I did it anyway. Or in here, I knew it was wrong, but I was doing it. That is a reasoning, an imagination, a, what did I call it here? Let me give it back to you again. A, a consideration and reflection that precedes the determination of a conduct. It may be brief, and the less you listen to the Lord, the harder it is to hear it. But that's why 
you have a pastor. A pastor, if he's spirit-filled, tongue-talking, word-faith, Bible-believing, submitted to the lordship of the call, but more than that, of the Lord and the word, if he is anointed and teaching the word of God and teaching you the uncompromised word of God and he loves you and he's speaking into you, he has, by divine calling, a right to speak to you during the consideration and the reflection before you do the conduct. So why do you need to be in church? Why do you need to have a pastor that is word-believing, spirit-filled? Because he can, under the unction of the Holy Spirit, and he can, by the authority and the right, speak into you that which is necessary for you to stop the conduct before you do it. That's good. You know it's good. Makes you not even want to move, doesn't it? You just stay here, Kathy. You and so, why do we need a church? Now, let me tell you how to prove that. How many of you know what marketing is? Of course. Good marketing touches you in the consideration and reflection realm before you act on it. They try to influence you there to get you to act. And everybody has no trouble with that. But if I tell you that a pastor has spiritual authority to do that, you look at me like, not you, but you know, some would. You need a pastor because if he's a shepherd that loves you, he's going to lead you beside still waters. Not just always pouring in the oil and wine because you got away. He can speak by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ and the Word, and sometimes it's a teaching. Why? Watch this. To influence you. I can't make you do it, but I can't make you use authority, but I can influence you to do it by touching that area of consideration and reflection and make you cast down those imaginations. Bring your thoughts into obedience. That comes from being under the authority of a pastor. So I made a note here. Let me give it to you. The church, not just the pastor. Now, see, you thought all this was falling on me. Now I get to put it back on you too. The church, the church that the gates of hell will not overpower, conquer, or prevail against. The church with a spirit-filled led pastor can teach and preach and reach into the realm of the spirit and influence you with the Word of God, others with the Word of God, and put it within the truth of the Word, information and knowledge of God, from God, to influence your decision to act before you act. How many of you know that would be so good to be influenced to do good before we do bad? Now, I don't have a lot of time, so I may just shoot these out here for you. Notice it said the weapons of our military campaign. We have weapons. See, we forget. We have weapons. You don't just have your pastor to do this. He's supposed to. But you and I, we, individually and collectively as a church, we have weapons of our warfare, the weapons of our military campaign, the weapons of our campaign are mighty through God to the casting down, pulling down of strongholds so that we can influence people before they act and bring every thought into captivity. So we have weapons. Let me give you a few. This is not anything new. These are to pull down the strongholds of consideration, of reflections, bring every thought into captivity. The first one is easy. Turn to Hebrews 4.12. I may go back and spend some time on these later, but not right now. I think I've given you enough to churn around and think about while you're eating your steak and potatoes and gravy with buttered rolls. See, it's a time for lunch, and I'm watching all of your face as they do. Maybe some peas or green beans. And I know some of you say, well, that's not very keto. Okay, all right, you're going to have a slab of alfalfa that looks like and talks like and smells like meat, and then you're going to have some uh, cauliflower and some 
Brussels sprouts, and there you've got you separated. Okay. Mine sounded a whole lot better than you know it did. Anyway, Hebrews 4.12, look at this. Here is your first weapon, the Word of God. The Word of God is your first weapon. You got it right in your hand, and it's supposed to be in your heart. For the Word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division or the dividing of soul and spirit and of joints and marrows and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. If we're bringing every thought into captivity, the word of God is your first weapon because it divides it, it, it separates it, it brings it into the realm that it needs. So the word of God is your first weapon and we've been given the word of God. That's why you need to hear it, see it, study it, love it, fall in love with it over and over and over again and continue to just grow in it. So one of your first weapons is the Word of God. Your second weapon, it turned to Philippians 2. Now, Brother Copeland just did a whole week's teaching on this. Your second weapon is the name of Jesus. So many times we hear people say, well, Jesus. And I'm thinking, hell, that's the name above every name. But they're not using it like that. They're using it in a little bit different tone. But you have the name of Jesus. Look at Philippians 2.9. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him. Now, the King James says a name. But the New King James and all the rendering of it, look at, say it properly. Therefore God has highly exalted him and given him the name. The name. Not a name. The name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, those in heaven and those on earth and of those under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You have been given the name. We have been born again by the authority of the name. The name in Matthew 28 says, but all authority and power in heaven and earth has been given unto me. Now, you go. That was a releasing of that anointing and power of the name. And remember, they came back and said, even the demons are subject to your name. He's been given the name that's above everything. It's not Jesus, or, uh, because there's a lot of people been named Jesus. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about the name that it was bestowed upon him, that he got by conquest, and that he got because God the Father put and received that and he earned it by bequest by conquering in the very lowest pits he has the name and at that name every knee shall bow in the heavens on the earth and under the earth so you've got the word of God and you've got the name of Jesus you have weapons and they are mighty to the pulling down of strongholds third thing you got the knowledge of God now, let me say something here, and I want you to catch this. There is a difference between sincerity and being right. I know some people that are sincerely wrong. Everybody with me? Just being sincere. I know some people that say the stupidest things, and they're sincere about it. They're just sincerely wrong. Sincerity is not to be confused with being right. I don't care how somebody supposes or is sincere about it. If it's not the knowledge of God, it's not right. It has to be the knowledge of God. That's why the church was in the dark ages for long. Because everybody thought God was a... A hard tyrant and a, and a God with a stick. And all he wanted you to do was step out of line so he could beat you up and beat you down. It made people upset when Jesus came along and said, he's a good God. He's my father. Well, how dare you do that? They had a different aspect. The knowledge of God is what sets you free. The word, yes, and knowing the word. But knowledge, you and I have not just the word of God and the name of Jesus. We have the knowledge of God. You and I are supposed to know God like the world doesn't. How else could we influence them? Only the knowledge of God can be right. Fourth weapon is faith. You have faith. You don't have to turn there, but Mark 9, 23, Jesus said, If you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. 
if you can believe. Faith. Faith is the substance of things hoped for, evidence of things not seen. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. And he who pleases God is, is made to richly enjoy all things. So faith. So we have the Word of God. We have the name of Jesus. We have knowledge of God. And we have faith. That's just, already I've given us enough weapons to set the enemy to flight. And to influence people before they act. Not after they act, we better get to praying. After they act, we better get to binding and loosing. We have been given the keys of the kingdom, Matthew 16, at the end of that, the church, the gates of hell will not prevail against the church. Behold, I give you the keys of the kingdom, and whatsoever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatsoever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. That's literally saying whatever Jesus has bound and loosed in heaven, you can bind it and loose it here. But we're supposed to be doing that before the behavior. Not after, and that's where pastors come in. Why do you think the devil, the first thing he tries to get you to do is not go to church? The second thing, if you are going to go to church, is he wants to try to point out all the problems. How many of you realize church would be perfect if it wasn't for people? And someone said, yeah, yeah. Well, did you know you're one of those people, so I wouldn't yell too loud. Church would be perfect. And then if you got perfect, the world would crucify you. They crucified the only perfect one that ever walked here. But he's given us gifts and abilities. So if the devil can't get you to stay out of church, then he'll get you to criticize. And if he can't get you to criticize because of imperfect people that are growing and wanting to mature, then he'll get you to feel like you don't need a pastor. Well, I'm the head of my house. I had a person, and you've heard my story before. It's not a new one, but I'll give it to you again. I had a guy when I first came to town and was starting the church, and I was trying to, to get people in the church, came to me and said, well, I love you, and I appreciate it. When you have special meetings, we'll be there. He said, but uh, uh, I have my church in my house me and my family. I said, oh, really? He said, yeah. He says they continued from house to house. Well, I reminded him that Acts 2.42 said, did say that they went from house to house and in the sanctuary. Well, he didn't like that. He said he's a priest and a, and a, and a prophet to his family and everything else like that. I said, okay, let me ask you this question. Who do you call when you're sick? He didn't answer me. If you're the pastor of your that, who do you call when you're sick? The word says, if there be any sick among you, call for the elders of the church. Have them anoint them with oil and pray the prayer of faith. In other words, we all need a pastor. I need a pastor. I thank God I have been privileged to have two or three. I've had Jimmy Hester. I've had Simon Purvis. And now I got Jerry Savelle, Doc Barkley. These are men of God that's been all over the world that are pastors. Then I have access to the prophets. And now I have an evangelist, and Dr. Roberts told us, here's my cell phone, call me anytime you need anything like that. And I said, well, did you see anything that you needed? No, no, I'd tell you if I did. And he would. We're always open for correction and always open to be. So we have faith. Now here's another one. Are you ready for that? Prayer. I'm not talking about the world's prayer, and I'm not talking about what people call the Lord's prayer, Father, which are, I mean, I was watching something on TV the other day, and they said, and it was like, we have, we got to get something done. We got to pray. Let's get together and pray. And they grabbed hands, and I thought, wow, this is going to, I got to hear what they got to say. And they are, our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. I'm thinking, That's better than nothing, right? But how many of you know that's how to pray, not what to pray? They said, Jesus, teach us how to pray. He said, when you pray, do it in this wise. 
Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done in earth as it is. So, 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 so. Give us this day our day. You know the prayer that you've prayed your whole life. That's how to pray, not what to pray. Then we have all the rest of the word teaching us what to pray. But you have prayer. Let me show you. Turn to, to James 5. Let me show you something there. I think it's about the 16th verse. Let me show you something. James 5, 16. I want you to see something here. James 5, 16. We have the Word of God. We have the name of Jesus. We have the knowledge of God. We have faith. And now we're seeing another weapon we have is prayer. Look at James 5, 16. Let's do something. I'll read the first of it, but I'm actually interested in the last part. Listen to this. Confess your trespasses one to another. Pray for one another that you may be healed. So we center up on that, but look at the next part. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man, righteous, righteous woman, righteous church, a righteous people avails much, not a little. Might, sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. A effectual, fervent prayer of people wanting to do right, live right, and act right avails much. But the Passion Translation is great here because it goes in line with what I'm showing. Now watch this. In James 5, 16, the last part. Tremendous power is released through the passionate, heartfelt prayer of a godly believer. Tremendous power. So you got the word of God, you got the name of Jesus, you got the knowledge of God, you got faith, and you got prayer. Can you handle just a couple more? I got four minutes. You still get your own time. Here's probably the least used weapon of all your arsenal. The least used. Praise. People don't understand. Praise is not just you singing and dancing and shouting. Praise is a weapon. Turn to Psalms 8, verse 1 and 2. Look at this. Jesus quoted Psalms 8, 1 and 2, trying to get something across to us. Look at Psalm 8, 1 and 2. O Lord, our Lord, how excellent is your name in all the earth, who have set your glory above the heavens, out of the mouth of babes and nursing infants, you have ordained strength. Now, Jesus quoted it, and the King James translated that as praise. You've ordained praise because of your enemies that you may silence the enemy and the avenger. Have you ever had somebody, it, not that you wanted them to do any harm, you just wish they'd shut up? Anybody know what I'm talking about? I see that on the TV constantly. I wish they'd just shut up. Just shut up. Everything coming out of your mouth. It's self-serving, self-seeking. It has nothing to do with the things of God or a blessing. Praise ordains strength and stills the mouths of the enemy. If you don't believe that, I got a challenge for you. Oh, I've been setting you up for this one. The next time somebody comes to you and starts gossiping, they just start running somebody down. Let's say your pastor or whoever it is, leadership, or somebody else in the church that you're connected to, your body. Your hand's not over here, you stupid arm. I'm gonna, it's not doing these things. The next time somebody does that, you just go, wait, tall glory. How did, start singing and praising God and worshiping God. Spin around a few times and just enjoy and worship God. You'd be surprised they'll just kind of, You stilled their mouths without telling them to shut up. Praise has a strength to it, a power, tremendous powers in prayer. But praise has a tremendous power. You remember Acts 16, you don't have to turn there. At midnight, Paul and Silas were beaten in stocks in the innermost part. Of, it says, at midnight they prayed and sang praises unto God. And the prisoners heard them, so it wasn't silent praise. Sit in here, Pastor, I'm doing it. 
it, they heard it. And the building shook as if with a great earthquake. But of course we know it's not an earthquake because nothing fell down except the doors open. Praise has a power to it. Now I got two more and I'm not going to cover them just to say this. The seventh tool that you have, the word says don't be a hearer of the word but a doer only. The second or the seventh weapon you have is action. Go. Remember Jesus said, go ye? He didn't say, sit ye. Do, go, cast. He gave you action things to do. So it's a weapon. The devil wants you to do nothing and act like you're being pious or holy. Action, do something. Some will say, well, if I do something, I'll make a mistake. Probably so, all of us will. But at least we're doing something. And there'll be a correction. And then the next one is probably going to spend some time on it the best I save the best for last you have not only the word of God the name of Jesus the knowledge of God faith and prayer and action and praise you have the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ how many of you were raised Pentecostal Pentecostal holy put it up there high let me see you then know and can verify what I'm saying in the Pentecostal movement there was a term that they use all the time. You've got to plead the blood. Plead the blood. Plead the blood. And what was amazing to me, now no offense to all of you, but I, I was amazed as I got to travel and minister that so many people that were pleading the blood didn't even know what they were doing. They were just told plead the blood. But plead is a legal term. And it's not contrary to faith. Someone said, well, I'm a faith person. I don't plead the blood. Well, you've just put one of your weapons away that you can help. You To plead means to, de, to declare your case of the blood. So you declare the case of the blood. Lester Summerall tells the story, and if any of you have seen the video or talked to it, if you get a chance to see it, you need to see it because it's one of those... Uh, we believe it because I know Lester Summerall and he told me, but you almost have to see it to believe it. But he was in Bilibid prison in the Philippines and there was a woman, they called him and see if he could help. No, no doctors couldn't help, nobody couldn't help, the preachers couldn't help, none of them. They wanted Lester Summerall to come out there because right in the camera, bite marks would come up on her. She's screaming and yelling and teeth marks would show up where something invisible bit her. It's on video. Lester took the cameras with him. It was a biting devil, and it was biting her, and it leave teeth marks, and there was no explanation of it. And they're not, And everybody said, well, we've used the name, and we've, uh, we've told it to go and commanded it to go, and it still just keeps biting her, and we don't want to go in there anymore because we think it'll bite us. Lester went in there and said, by the authority of the name of Jesus and his name only, and then he's false. I plead the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ, and you come out. And it left her instantly. And she got set free. He put the power of the blood in there, and that demon hadn't heard that before. It appropriated the blood. So you've got the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why you have communion so that you won't forget the power that's in it, the price that paid to give it to us. So all of these are weapons. And I had the honor and privilege, and I'll tell you right now to this day, I went over there when I went over to set Brother Copeland's office up and get ready for him to come to a meeting. I went to Billabid Prison. They asked if I would come minister. And I went, wow, yeah. Well, I didn't know all the circumstances, but they had to grow their own food, they had to do this, or somebody had to bring them food, or they died. There was no medical facilities there. If you had something happen to you, you either got over it or you died. Someone said, why? Because it was for the, the worst of the worst of the worst criminals and those that were basically clinically insane or, criti or criminally insane, and they asked me to come. So I went, and there was a banner outside that said, Welcome, Billy Rash, associate to Ginnacobin. Then under there it said, He came 9,000 miles to minister to us. 
And they wouldn't let me preach and pray to them, for them, until they get a parade. And here's all of these, I mean, some of them couldn't even, and they're all just going by, you know, and I'm going, you know, I'm waving at them. They all, like, a, like they were letting me examine the truths, is what Linda Cross, the missionary that, was, that got us in there, was saying. And I'm thinking like this, and, and I, I shared with them when it was my time. She was an unusual interpreter. She wanted me to preach for 30 minutes, then she'd interpret for 30. Never had that. It's usually sentence or paragraph, and then they'd go. Well, I asked the guy that was very, Ernie Reb that was there with me, that it was a, an American but speak fluent Tagala in the language. I said, now, is she getting what I'm saying? And he said, word for word. And, uh, and I told them about the lepers. I told them about the healing miracles. And then I said, now I'm going to pray for you. Well, I thought that would be just a, you know, prayer line. All 4,000 of them decided they needed prayer. And I was all right with them. And they come up over here, come up. I'd lay hands on them. They'd go out over there, and then they'd go off a little bit, pow, fall out. And there was a pile of them over there. And if it got full, they just move another pile. And they came up, and this one guy came up, and he was walking. And I'm going to show you the power of the blood and the name. And I had watched that video and studied it before I went there of Lester's because I wanted to be prepared. In case any of those spiritual wickedness and high places were hanging around, I wanted them to know I knew what I was doing. I look back on it now, and I thought, oh, gee, idiot, how un... But this guy walked up, and the bone was sticking out of his arm. Out, it had green on it. It was uh, and it's on camera. And I'm looking, and I see him over there coming, and I'm praying for people. They're going over there, and he's moving up closer. And I'm thinking, oh gee, what if I lay hands on him and nothing happens? And I said, shut up, devil. You are not going to influence me. So he came up, and I don't know why this was the way or whatever. I just thought, I'm laying my hands on him. So I slapped him on that shoulder, right on that bone, laid hands on it, took my hand off, and it was totally healed. Gone. Totally back in. He goes, whoo, and he's out there running. And for the rest of the meeting, he's running in circles, screaming. Well, I guess so. And they videoed that. I've still got a hold of trying to get a hold of Linda Cross to get a copy of it. But she said, told me, I got the copy of that if you want it. I said, I want it. Because personally, I, I had been involved with miracles, but I had never seen anything like that. And I've seen a lot since. What, isn't it strange that some of the greatest and most powerful ministry gifts, breakthroughs, and anointings are in sometimes the worst of conditions? If he didn't get healed... He had no help. He didn't have any doctors, nothing. I checked on them the next time we went to the Philippines, and they were growing their own garden, having church, and that guy was one of the praise leaders. Just like the leper that I ministered to in Kulion, he was one of the praise leaders in the leper car. Isn't it amazing that everybody that gets a miracle touch from God seems to see the significance of praise but the church. Ooh, it's quiet. That's not a con condemnation or a put down. This is a praise team, but they're not here to do our praising for us. They're here to lead us as we get into it. Everybody with me? And so we should be praying. And then the blood. I pled the blood used the name. I quoted every healing scripture I could. They didn't, took my hand off, and it was gone. Listen, they have it on camera. You should have seen my face. I was more surprised than anybody. I'm serious. I took my hand off. Whoa! I was screaming. I was doing a jig, you know. I should have been the one. Okay. <laughs> surprised me as much. And you know good and well, God's used you to minister and influence people, and it surprises you as much as it does them. But the church, the reason you need a born-again, spirit-filled, word-teaching, word-preaching, anointed pastor is so he can speak into that realm 
that affects you before you ask and pull those gaps. That's why you have to have and come under the authority of the pastor. That doesn't make the pastor special because we have churches, as I said, that have a so-called pastor, but they don't. I've told you before, and I'm not trying to make you think anything in me, but I have promised that I will be the best pastor I can be for you and growing and maturing because I love you and I want to see you. Don't take this wrong. I want to see you act and behave right because we got to influence everybody we come in contact with. Amen? Did you get anything out of this? I'm going to stop right there. I am not through with who's your daddy. Now, if you're wondering why aren't you through with who's your daddy, because you don't look like him just yet. But, boy, you're getting there. You're getting there quicker than I think ever anybody can imagine. That's why I tease Joe and Kathy. They're, they're going to be moving out of state. I tease them that you can log on because I'm still going to pastor them on the on the. Internet. Some people can't be here. They can watch and log on. Why? Because it gives me the ability to speak. If I'm praying and doing what I'm supposed to be doing, and I am pledging to do that, if I'm doing those things, then I'll speak to you before. Now, you have to be influenced to listen. And what I mean is, if you hear my voice saying, don't do that, then that's probably what you need to do is not do that because I have the, the ability as pastor to affect you in the spirit realm. I'm not talking about manipulation. I'm talking about pulling down strongholds and bringing your thoughts into captivity to where, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to do what the word says, what pastors have taught me. And all of a sudden you get a victory. And the devil knows he can't bother you in that, so he'll try to find something else to bother you with. Have you ever noticed that? That's what he does. But if you beat him once, you can beat him every time. In fact, you can resist him to the point he flees from you. Instead of you saying, oh, God, I'm up another day, the devil says, oh, God, they're up. And he's dreading the fact you're up. Stand to your feet. Glory to God. I want to encourage you. Are you going to make an announcement about the bingo, or do you want me to? Are you going to make that announcement, Pastor Renee? All right, you're the man. But say this with me. God loves you. We love you. Jesus is Lord, and love prevails over all. Love you guys. See you Wednesday, Pastor Renee. Praise God. Hey, we got bingo coming up Friday, August the 27th at 7 p.m. here on campus, and we'd like for you to show up and be a part of this. Um, so what I'm going to do right now is take a picture of everybody in every section. And then I'm going to go back and compare it to the list and see if you've not signed up yet. And then we're going to go ahead and sign you up, okay? That will, no, just, just, anyway. So make sure you sign up. That's in the lobby. And if you could bring some snacks or things like that, that would be great. But it's on the list of what we're asking you to bring, you know? I'll tell you what I like. We can do that, you know, once we get off the, the service. No, just teasing. And so please sign up. And then uh, we w we're going to have a good time on the 27th. And it's going to be a fun time of fellowship and and I've been told that there's going to be some games, excuse me, not games, surprises. So um, we're just going to have a good time. And also, John Paul, thank you for being here with us this morning. Let's give him a good hand clap. Amen. I want to encourage you. We're here on Wednesday at 7 p.m. And we're uh, at, at back again at 10 o'clock next Sunday. And please take time to read the bulletin. Activities going on this week. If you need prayer, we'll have prayer partners up front to pray and believe God with you. Um, I didn't see... I was here Wednesday night, and some that may not have been here Wednesday night, I just want to thank you for praying for me, and I appreciate it, and I feel your prayers, and uh, I'm glad to be back in God's house. I'm glad to be back and see this side of your face. Amen. Nothing wrong with the back side of your head, but it's wonderful to see this side of your face, and I thank God for that. And um, so praise the Lord. God is so good. And also, I said this on Wednesday, and since I got the microphone, I'll go ahead and say it today. Today I turned 30 years old. Amen. 30 years old with my walk with God. Amen. Uh, August the 22nd, 1991, I got born again, accepted Jesus Christ as the Lord of my life. And ever since then, 
I've been crazy for Jesus. I've been loud for Jesus. And I will continue to do that until I go see him face to face. And it was a Thursday night when I got born again. It just happens to be this day. And here's the cool thing about this. You know, God says he'll give you the desires of your heart. Pastor Billy was ordained um, in 1981, August the 22nd. My son was born August the 22nd. So he turns 22 today. And so uh, it's a very special day to me. And, uh, and I just wanted to share that with you. And uh, I'm just so excited that I'm saved and I'm born again. And I'm going to heaven. Amen. And, that, and I know you are too. So with every head bowed, please, and nobody looking around, maybe you say, Pastor Renee, I've never been born again, and I've never accepted Jesus Christ, and I would like to get born again this morning. I would like to accept Jesus this morning. If that's you, simply raise your hand, wave it towards me, and I would be honored to pray for you this morning and introduce you to Jesus Christ, the Lord of my life. Amen. Anybody here that's never done that? Maybe you're watching by the Internet, and you've never done that. All you got to do is believe in your heart, confess with your mouth. Romans chapter 10, and the Bible says, that thou shall be saved. It doesn't say you need to go clean yourself up. It didn't say anything like that. It just says, believe in your heart and confess with your mouth. And the Bible says that you'll be saved and you'll be born again. And that's all you have to do. And if this is the first time you're making that decision, we'd love to hear from you. Amen. So that we can get you a Bible and, and, and send materials to you. Amen. So, Father, we thank you now as we go home, as we go about our next coming week, Lord God. And as school has just recently started on Wednesday, Lord God, we speak divine protection, divine safety over our schools, over our teachers, Lord God, all the buses, the kids and parents going going to school to drop their kids off, Lord. We just speak divine protection, divine safety over them, Lord. And Father, we thank you now. And as Pastor mentioned at the beginning of the service, Lord God, we pray for those that are in Afghanistan, Lord God, our law enforcement, our firefighters, Lord God, and those that are fighting these fires now, Lord. We ask that you just cause a supernatural uh, thing to take place and those fires will just stop in Jesus' name, Lord God. And Father, we pray for the soldiers that are in Afghanistan, Lord God, and our Christians and brothers in the Lord that are there as well. Father, we lift them up, Lord God. And as Pastor just said, we plead the blood of Jesus over that country. We plead the blood of Jesus over the generals and all the people that are there, Lord God. And so, Father, we thank you now as we leave. We thank you that we leave with the angels of God having charge over us. And Father, we thank you for a blessed week in Jesus' name. Amen. We love you. God bless you. And we'll see you this week.